All right, awesome. Cool. So uh, certainly uh, environmental storytelling is important and how we lay out these stories to people, as you'll hear, can make a really big difference. Uh, I grew up in South Florida where there are uh, kind of a uh, intersectionality of cultures. And I recall uh, right around, uh, you know, high school, the big coal rolling giant lifted trucks became very popular in South Florida for whatever reason. You had these massive smokestacks on these things and they'd have uh, anti-climate bumper stickers and things like that, which was pretty wild to start seeing. So lots of conversations to be had with people, needless to say. If anyone wants to share just a personal thing of uh, environmental storytelling, we have a microphone right there in the middle of the room. Uh, if you do want to talk on there, fair warning, you will be uh, filmed. We have ca cameras around here. Um, but if anyone wants to share, please, by all means, do so, because uh, we love that kind of thing. Great. Thank you, thank you. All right. Uh, you know, these talking points are so important. And in looking at some post-COVID data, right, one of the things environmentalists were really curious about was how would things like lockdown and uh, the persistence of things like COVID Delta affect the environment, right? You, you had a lot of less people traveling, a lot less people out on the road or in the air flying. What would be the effects? Well, globally, it seems as though carbon emissions during lockdown went down about 20%. And uh, that that was just about what we see the transportation sector as contributing to uh, in as far as climate goes, right? Of course, we've got then, um, you know, besides transportation, things like our industrial agricultural system. We also have, of course, the uh, production of electricity for buildings in cities, which is actually the biggest cause of uh, a city's emissions of fossil fuels into the atmosphere is powering buildings, right? So a lot more people were home, a lot more people turning the air conditioning down in the summer, uh, you know, carbon emissions actually went up in some cases. But, you know, what we did see in COVID data was that the concern for the environment decreased. And you had people who were maybe very staunch about no uh, single use plastic, no styrofoam, all of a sudden, when it comes to getting takeout, they're a little bit more lenient all of a sudden. And this seems to be across the board of people uh, even identified as very strong environmentalists. And it, it's an aspect of human psychology that when we have other things to worry about, the environment kind of takes a back burner. You also see that in countries that have risen out of poverty very uh, rapidly. We're talking just a few generations like China, 
where as people become more affluent and can put food on the table and have electricity and become literate, they start to care more about the environment, right? And that when they don't have those kinds of things and have major food insecurity, transit insecurity, energy poverty, they don't care so much about the environment. And so really fascinating things about human psychology to think about. So thank you for bringing that perspective of how it affects us right here in Orlando, right? Of people's sentiments and what's important. That's why environmental storytelling is so key. So I am very excited to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Joe Tankersley. And uh, we met, goodness, maybe five years ago, six years ago, probably, just out on the scene of ideation in Orlando. You may know that Orlando has been a uh, experimental prototype community of tomorrow, as they like to say. Uh, that's actually the moniker of Epcot, in case you didn't know. It was originally thought of as being a large community that people could live in. Unfortunately, Walt Disney passed away before that was realized. And uh, Orlando has always kind of had a, a gleam in its eye of being a place of innovation. And I'm really happy to say that, especially over the last 10 years, Orlando has really stepped up to be an innovation-based city with our medical city out in Lake Nona, a lot of tech startups here in Orlando, a lot of uh, merchant services and uh, alternate uh, alternative reality, AI type things here, a thriving video game scene, a thriving sustainability scene. So a lot of good things in Orlando. Joe, please come on up and, uh, and, and, and take us all on the journey of imagination of environmental storytelling. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you guys for inviting me to come tonight. Um, as Clay said, I've followed his work for probably the last six or seven years. And whenever I talk to groups about shining examples of environmental activism, ideas in the hive are the ones that I refer to most often. Um, and so you guys are all about advocacy and doing. And what I want to do tonight is shift your gears a little bit, because I want to talk about storytelling and, and sharing ideas, not just the advocacy piece of it. Um, and so what I'm going to do very quickly is I'm going to talk at a very high level about why stories really matter for the environmental movement. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we create the ones that are really the most effective. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of examples. I'm going to invite you guys to help me with a project that we're launching later this month to expand storytelling across the entire state of Florida for the environmental movement. And then finally, I'll just leave you with some tips so that you can think about whatever stories you tell, whether it's when you meet somebody when you're out canvassing, whether you want to sit down and write something, uh, or just sharing things with strangers on the street that might help you do that a little bit better. So hopefully all of that will give you something to take away from tonight that you can actually use. Why does it matter? Because the future always starts with a story. Study after study after study has been done. And all the results of the studies about what works best when you're trying to create systemic change, major change, comes to the same conclusion. All the data in the world alone is not enough. As much as we'd love for those facts and figures to actually change people's activities and what they do, it doesn't work most of the time, except for a very small group of people, the people who show up at meetings like this. For everyone else, the truth is, is that you have to win both hearts and mind because stories are critical to getting people to change. And the reason is really simple. Most people are terrified by the unknown. And when you suggest to them that the future is going to be radically different than the world they live in today, that scares them. So they need a story to hang on to, something that will help them think about what they actually want to do that makes it seem less terrifying. Now, before we go too deep into this rabbit hole, I'm gonna stop and give you a little bit of background on me, just so you understand what my particular biases and point of view is. I am a product of the Walt Disney story machine. I spent 20 years working at Walt Disney Imagineering, first as a writer and a producer, and later as a futurist. And there are all sorts of things we can talk about about that. And there are all sorts of things we can say about Walt Disney and the good and the bad that he's done for this community and the whole world. But for me, there were two really important lessons that came from that experience. The first one was where I really learned about the power of storytelling. And that happened because of an assignment I got early in my career. I was given the job of going out and researching Walt Disney for an attraction that some of you may have actually have seen called 100 Years of Magic. Now, I didn't really know anything about Disney or the machine when I went there. I was just looking for a job and they hired me, right? What I found out was, was that the man was an incredibly interested 
in creating the future. Way back before Epcot, he had something called Tomorrowland, the stories that were actually in his first television show, where he promoted things like going to the moon, where he suggested that we could have futures where plastic would be everywhere, right? Where we would have great highways and nuclear energy and all these other visions of the future. And he was incredibly effective at making those stories stick. And the truth is that the world we live in today is Walt Disney's Tomorrowland. Now, you may not agree with all of it, and there are certainly some things that we baggage we should be getting rid of in terms of that high-tech sort of impersonal world that was a thing in the 60s and 70s. But you can't deny how incredibly effective it was. The second lesson that I learned was that you can get a job and call yourself a futurist. That's really cool. Now, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do actually work with groups and organizations and communities around the world to help them think differently about the future. And the role of a futurist is to expand people's horizons, to get them to understand how change happens, to get them to understand what's driving change and what possibilities might be out there. And so when I took those two things, put them together, I have spent the better part of the last decade trying to figure out how we replicate the magic of Walt Disney storytelling, but for a different end. Not for that high-tech plastic nuclear reactor in everybody's kitchen, but for an environmental green future one that makes a better world for all of us. And that's why I am so invested in this idea of storytelling and what you can actually do with it. And this is what I've learned. The environmental movement has a serious story problem. Ever since Rachel Carlson's book, Silent Spring, came out, there has been a perception that environmentalists are running around screaming that the sky is falling. And there's a good reason for that. The sky is falling. And most environmentalists who look at the statistics will tell you that without any worrying about it whatsoever, right? But the problem is, is it goes back to that idea of hearts and minds. Is that, that alone has not been enough to really, really shift the dial. As Clay just talked about, when we have a COVID lockdown and suddenly we're stuck at home again, that styrofoam starts to come back. You have to have something more than the, just the, here's the data, here's the facts, and if you don't recycle today, then we're all going to be dead and gone tomorrow. It hasn't worked. It's only moved us a little bit. Today, we have that compounded by another problem. That is, there is a serious effort from a consecrated, concentrated minority to look at every suggestion for positive environmental action and reframe it as if it's a threat to justice, fairness, and the American way. Everything that comes out, and we've seen more and more of this in the last few years, every discussion of the environment has been turned into this sort of political hot potato. And people are using it to convince people not to think about changing. And they're winning. That's the honest truth. We're making progress in a lot of areas, but the truth is overall that the majority of people that we need to really be focused on this aren't, in part because they're scared. So how do we solve that? The first thing we do to solve that is take a step back. And we really sort of think about the history, history of this moment and where we are in time. And the truth is, the old story, the story that is essentially 20th century modern predatory capitalism is being shredded by the reality of the world that we live in. The idea that humans are somehow apart from our environment that we stand above it, that we have the ability to extract and, and consume without any responsibility whatsoever, is running into the hard reality that we cannot do that. This is a finite planet. So what we need is a new story. We need all of the activities that this group is doing and other groups are doing, but we also have to have that new foundational story that goes with it, that underlies it, that helps people understand why, that helps them understand why they make the decisions every day. So how do we do that? We start to create a story that acknowledges the reality, that starts with the fact that we know there are serious problems that actually exist, that there are threats to our future that are coming faster and faster every day. But we don't stop there. We also have to think about how do we give hope for a better tomorrow, for a future where we actually have addressed some of these issues, where we've started to solve these problems, and where we've raised everybody up, and it's more equitable, more just, and more abundant in the future. What's the key to that? For me, at least, it's starting with reframing the question of what is the good life? Reframing this concept of what do we mean when we say we want abundance, we want everything. We understand what it means in the capitalist model from the 20th century, 
What does it mean in the 21st century in a sort of new capitalist or an environmental capitalist or even a post-capitalist world that we're actually talking about? That's where we have to start and look and think about how do we again create stories that will underlie all of these everyday decisions that we want people to actually make. Let me get specific. We need to think about stories that do three things. First of all, stories that inform. We know how to do that, right? You look at any environmental publication, you look at any podcast from any environmentalist, and we know what the problem is. We understand the seas are rising, that it's getting hotter, that we have giant mountains of garbage floating in the oceans. We've got the information piece down. But what we need to do is move beyond that. We need to think about how we also inspire people. And when I talk about inspiring people, I want you to flip your point of view. Because too many of us as environmental activists think about inspiration being, wouldn't it be great if we solved X? What you really need to do is that person you're trying to convince, you need to listen to them and ask them, what's important to you? What are your goals? What are your needs? What are you terrified of? for your parents, for your children, for yourself, for your community. That's the key to where we find that piece of inspiration. And then the third piece is those stories have to empower people. One of the problems that happens when we start to get more positive in our storytelling is if we leave out the steps that are necessary to get there, then everybody goes, that's a great story, I really love it, and I hope you guys take care of it and make it happen. We have to make people understand that creating this positive future this green future is up to them, that it's partially their job as well, and it's going to benefit them when we actually do it. Now, at this point, some of you are going, he's that crazy Disney guy living with the pixie dust, right? He wants all these crazy, optimistic, utopian stories that we want to spread with people. I want to warn you against that, because just as much as we need to stay away from the dystopian stories, we can't paint a picture of the future that's completely rosy and perfect. History was messy, something we're being reminded of a lot these days, right? The present, incredibly messy. The future, unfortunately, is going to be messy too. So we need to hit that sort of sweet spot, the place where we talk about a future that is just at the very end of our reach and maybe stretches us a little bit more than we actually can think that we could go. The term I use is this one, practopia. It came from Heidi and Alvin Toffler back in the 1970s. They're some of the original futurists. Uh, and the idea is thinking about a future that's not perfect, but it's one that we can measure and prove is better than today. One where we can see that the environment is healthier, where people are living better lives, where there's more happiness and wellness amongst the general population. That's the kind of stories that I want you guys to aspire to tell to people when you're starting to share your stories. So is any of this real, or is this just some Disney guy with a crazy idea? There is actually an emerging movement to begin to do this, to meld the, what we understand about the problems and the crisis that we affect with some sense of a future that is more positive. And the one I'm going to talk about now came from the Extinction Rebellion. You guys all know who Extinction Rebellion is? Basically, they're well-known, primarily in Europe, for being the group that chains themselves to highways. Recently, I think they glued themselves to some piece of art somewhere. They're largely in serious protest. And their point is, the planet is burning up. We've got to get busy. We've got to get busy now. Most, for the most part, a younger generation movement. There are some older folks who certainly support what they do. But the idea is they're terrified by the future. So on one hand, they sort of contradict everything I just said, right? They're that sort of, here's the dystopian. Last year, they did something really interesting. They held their first solar punk storytelling showcase. They invited writers from anywhere in the world, young, old, any age, to submit stories of a positive future because they realized they needed to have that kind of balance. You have to have the yin and the yang in this. We have to acknowledge what's wrong, but we also have to create some hope. Now, for those of you, I'll ask another quick question. How many of you are familiar with the term solar punk? Okay. So that's my mission in life is to go tell people about solar punk. I can tell now. Solar punk is a, another emerging genre of storytelling. It started in the science fiction world, and it actually started in art. If you Google it online, you'll see tons of really interesting, beautiful pieces of art. And the idea is, is images of a future where solar power has replaced fossil fuel, where we've solved the energy crisis, 
And in most cases, it's also where we've dealt with a lot of these other things like social injustice, where we've created a more equitable future, a future that is green and bright and positive for everyone. And right now, it probably is the place where you'll find most of these sort of practopian stories about the future, because it is based, once again, on an understanding of what is possible, but also an imagination of what we really, really want to have happen. And so I'm going to take you a little further down the rabbit hole for just a minute. I'm going to give you an idea of one specific example, and it happens to be a storybook that I wrote. Um, to give you an idea of how these stories really can be built. So maybe you'll go off after this and build your own. Gabby's First Kiss, I was very honored to have one of my stories selected for the Extinction Rebellion showcase. And the information of that story came from work I'd done for about a decade with a group out of Tallahassee called the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes. And that's a group that's purpose is to warn people to be prepared for hurricanes here in Florida. And they started in the 1980s. And over the time that I worked with them, they more and more became aware that, wow, this problem is changing. It is being impacted by the climate. And the biggest thing I learned from them is the future of homes on the coast in this state, not a good thing. Because the old story, the idea of every time the hurricane comes through, the insurance company comes along and pays you and you can rebuild, that story is breaking down. So that's kind of the information background for this particular story. The inspiration came from an experience I had in 2018 when I was invited to join a group of environmentalists in Anna Maria Island, which is a small community off the, east, uh, off the west coast of Florida. We spent three or four days looking at what other people were doing, other examples of advocacy at work. And if you've never been to Anna Maria Island, you should take a trip over there sometime because what they've done in the little downtown area is really fascinating. They took out all the sidewalks. They're all permeable now. They have these little gardens where you can pick you know, herbs and vegetables. They just walk around and it's a beautiful little place. The second thing in that trip was we went to a place called Cortez Village. Cortez Village is a historical fishing village that has been there for hundreds of years, and they have a wonderful museum talking about how people, the early migrants came and ultimately stayed there, and they created this sort of ethnic fishing village that still is kind of there today. But it's being threatened by everything that's going on with environmental change. But what I saw there was an incredible sense of community, and I wanted to grab that. I wanted to think about what happens when a community comes together and really makes a change. And then finally, the question of empowerment, the kinds of things that you guys talk about here. The things of, you know, rewilding our coastlines, letting the mangrove swamps come back again, which is really the best protection we can have against the devastation from hurricanes. Smart materials. As a futurist, I spent a lot of time looking at what's going on in the next 10 years. So we're going to see some new materials that actually can make us more resilient in our building. And alternative energy. I have a friend that teaches at the University of South Florida, and his thing is building biodigesters. And if you haven't seen those, they're giant bags and they take all of the com food that would go to the compost, but instead of just going to compost, they use it to actually create a methane gas that you can use as an energy source. And I put all those things together, and I asked myself, how can I create a story behind that? Not just an essay, not just another report, but do something different. And this is the key to your story. You gotta find that piece that might inspire people. What's relevant to everybody? And I thought about the idea, what about first love? What about that first kiss? maybe by the side of the ocean, where the you know, waves are coming in at night and the, and the biodigesters flaming on the, who knows? But anyway, you can read the story if you want to. But the point is, is that I want you to see the elements that actually go into a story like that. Anybody can create those stories. My guess is you guys already have an area of expertise that you know about. Think about building those other pieces and what kind of story that you would actually create with them. And now, really quickly, I'm going to tell you about another project. And this is the one that we're launching this month uh, through the Practopia project. We call it Vacay 2047, Hope We're Still Here. And the idea is it's a story that starts by being told through a series of postcards. It's a story of a family going on a vacation to Florida in the year 2047. And I have to give you a little background on this. Before COVID, one of the groups that I worked with a lot were various tourism groups that were really starting to talk about how do we think about sustainability in the, in the tourism business, which is a huge, huge issue, particularly for Florida. COVID came along, and just like all those styrofoam things showed up, the tourism industry completely forgot about sustainability. All they're talking about now is getting heads in the beds. And so I am incredibly frustrated with the fact that they're sticking their head in the sand instead of dealing with something that is critical to the future of this state. 
we need to be talking about how do we do this. So this is my idea, one way to sort of jar that process back and have that conversation. So the way this works is, as I said, it starts with a series of postcards. Some of them are slightly provocative. We want to get your attention. We want to admit that we know that there is a real potential out there. But of course, even then, there's a little fun with them, right? These postcards come from a girl named Laura. We think she's 12 or 13 years old, and she's reporting back to her friends up north. On this trip, she took to this strange place called Florida in the year 2047. But we end with hope. We give them also an alternative future that suggests that maybe there's another way to think about tourism in this state, that maybe we can engage the idea of a green future and also think about creating the business that we actually want to create that is so important to these people. Because let's face it, they're not going to willingly walk away from their businesses. They'll let the state drown before they do that. Many of them will. That is the unfortunate reality of the business world as it exists. So we have to give them something that actually works better to get away from that. So that's the idea behind that. We, we hope these people who get these postcards, and we're going to send them to all sorts of folks, media people, people in the tourism business, government officials, uh, will notice that there's a little QR code. You click on the QR code. You go to a website. You get to read the rest of the story. Laura has a diary. Then, of course, you get to read the scenario behind all of that. And the final piece in all of it is you actually get asked if you would like to send postcards to other people, we will send you a group of postcards so that you can keep the conversation going. The final idea behind all of that is, is ultimately we're going to invite people to come back and join us to create communities of collaborative storytellers. Because the final step in all of this is not just me telling you stories or you telling other people stories but engaging the entire community and beginning to dream about what those stories are together. And that's what we really, really need to do. So finally, how can you become a green storyteller? What can you do with this? The first thing is any conversation you have about the environment, you need to start by knowing your audience. And that means listening to them. And sometimes that is incredibly hard. When Aunt Sally is ranting and railing about how this climate thing is a big hoax, you just want to throw the pie at her, right? We've all been in that situation. But we really have to listen to those people because we need everybody on board if we're really going to be able to make the change that we need to do. What are they concerned with? What really troubles them? What are their goals? And I think you'll find a common interest if you do that. Think forward. If you haven't seen anything else in the last 10 years, one of the things that we have totally seen is how fast technology is coming on board that is helping us address some of these sustainability issues. Think about what it might be in the next 10 years, maybe, or even 20 years. And that's where the futures thinking comes in. Redefine the concept of abundance. Right now, one of the biggest sticking points we have is that most people believe that to be environmentally safe or environmentally positive, they have to give up too much. What about the things they get? What about the ability, as I heard uh, sitting at the table down here, is if you live in a community where you can walk, you actually have to interact with your neighbors so you get to know each other better, so you have a better sense of community. What about the time that you actually buy back? And finally, you want to make sure that you inform and you inspire and you empower. How will it make their life better and what can they do with it? Now, if you don't want to run out and spend all your time writing a bunch of stories, because I know many of you have other things to do, you can also read and share positive stories. The more we can create a conversation, give them to your friends, maybe the, you know, the Hive would like to start a, a library somewhere in their, own line, in their own line reserve so that people can begin to share stories with each other. So that, huh? There you go. We can start sharing those stories on the blog. You know, think about what Extinction Rebellion did. They hosted a storytelling con contest and then posted those stories for everyone to see. And many of those stories have gone on to be published in different publications. And finally, whoops, okay, finally there's one last thing you can do. I have up with me tonight a few of those postcards. And what I really want all of you to do is I want you to take at least one, take three, four, five, a dozen, doesn't matter, and I want you to send them to somebody. Send them to somebody you want to be engaged in this conversation maybe a local public official, maybe somebody who is a climate denier, maybe somebody that you just think would be interested in helping us continue to share. And if you want to, you can go even further. You can go online, and you can actually see what we're doing, you can join it, we'll send you more, more postcards. Because the idea, once again, is the more we share these stories, the better able we are to actually create some change. So now I get to the last slide. 
And I just want to wrap up this idea because I think Clay has got an activity involved that this might help you with in just a minute. But when you sit down to start thinking about the stories, one of the great ways to, th to think about them is think about a day in the future. Not your future, but the person that you really want to change his future. Okay? What might it look like? Have a character for your story that's not you, that may be somebody who is a denier, somebody who's not as interested in all this, somebody who has other problems that are really more important to them than saving the planet. Okay? Think about their top goals. Try to pick two or three of them, very specific things. I want to be able to pay my rent. I want to be able to send my children to college. You know, those are the kinds of things that most people put way above environment right now. Then think about the environmental issue. See what I've done here? Most of us start these stories by thinking about the environmental issue. Don't make it first. Put it down lower. Think about how it relates to what these people actually want and need that they're doing. Imagine a solution. You may already know the solution. You may know what it is. Think about other ways that we can do it. And then think about ways that that solution would make that character's life significantly better in terms they would understand, things that would be important to them. And once you've done that, you'll find that you've got everything you need to write a story. And so what I expect all of you to do is to start becoming storytellers. Start writing these stories, sharing them online. You know, we'll create, send them to me. We'll put them together and we'll send them out to the whole world to try and distribute these stories to everyone that we're trying to do. So that's the idea. I want you guys to think about storytelling a day in the future based on what those other people need. And if we do that, we can begin to do the whole gamut of what we need to do, right? We change the foundation of what we believe that changes the actions, which makes it much easier for the things that Clay's talking about in terms of what the Hive is doing, in terms of creating real action that will actually make a positive future for all of us. So, I guess we have some time for questions before you take, you want to, anybody questions, including what is he talking about? Anybody, thoughts or things you want to add? In social media? Yeah. Okay. You know, it's interesting because some people are getting really good at it. Uh, it's hard because short, short, short micro stories are, are really, really tough. One of the interesting parallels is on TikTok, there's actually something called, uh, what is it? Is it, is it uh, TikBook or, or Book Talk? Book, one of those two, right? And it's where people get on and talk about books they love. So I could see that being a great way to sort of do the same thing with the environmental storytelling, you know. Um, and once again, it doesn't have to be written. Imagery is an incredibly powerful way to tell stories. Experience is an incredibly powerful way to tell stories. You know. Yeah, that's a great one. Anybody else? Anybody doing any storytelling?
ever seen any of those bus, those stories about the buses that go crazy? What? I, 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 one of the, th the keys, and this is the important part of this, is we, we, we have to step back a little bit. Right. And think about that positive green future as a background to those stories. And that's part of the, the, the appeal of the solar punk movement. You know, you can tell a, you can write a rom-com, you can write a detective story, you can do anything you want to, but set it in that environment. You can do the same thing if you think about your transit issues maybe. You know, move just one step away from it. So it doesn't feel to the person who's hearing the story like, oh, these, here are these people, they're bus people again, you know, and they want me to ride the bus. You know, think about some other way to sort of do that. You know, it's a little devious, but that's okay. That's what Walt taught me, right? He says, you know, if you, if you give people dessert first, then it's easier to get them to eat the broccoli. And that's part of what we want to do because at the end of the day, all we really care about is making sure that we have a future for this planet, right? Um, and we want everybody to be involved in that. We want everybody to have a voice in that. So think about ways to do it like that. I think, I think you might be surprised. Yes? Conversation the other day with some folks who are in, you know, mainstream Hollywood media, and, and they are not our friends in this, unfortunately. Um, so for people like that, it's about how do you make it magic, and that's a, that's a beautiful term. I love that. Yeah. Um, but so I think that's a really interesting example, though, of how you see over time a very slow shift. The animal kingdom is the modern answer to that, kind of. You know, um, Joe Rohde, who was the main Imagineer on that, is a avid environmentalist, um, and that's why he wanted to do that park. Um, you know, Disney's not going to give up on, on the mice, unfortunately. Um, but they are becoming a little bit aware of the fact that you, we need to change those stories a little bit. And it's very slow. For big companies, it's very slow. That's why it's up to you guys. You can do anything you want to, right? You know, you've got much more latitude. Yes? You nailed it, right? I mean, that's what it is. And once again, that's what Walt Disney did with the big technologically, everything's going to be electric, everything's going to be plastic story. He didn't do it alone, but that's what came out of that era. And see how incredibly effective it was, right? Uh, you know, and the fact that we're living with that right now is why it is so incredibly difficult to shift the larger mindset. We're going to have to change that foundational story, you know, and that's what, you're, what you really want to do. And you guys are doing a great job of it. You know, the one thing I was going to say, and I totally forgot it, was one of the great examples of how this storytelling works is Orlando. I've been here way too long. For years, Orlando was the place that, it's where Disney is, but nobody knew Orlando was actually not where Disney was. It was up the street, right? You know, and then it was the place where if you were an up-and-coming yuppie, 
and you were working in corporate America, this was your second job stop because it was so boring and vanilla. And so everybody would come here because it was average and then they would go away. And then a few years ago, I started hearing about this idea that Orlando was gonna be a green city. It started showing up on people's list of green cities. I was like, what city is this, right? Um, and to be honest, these people in the back of the room and you guys who've had a huge impact in terms of doing that, you know, cause you kept saying it, you kept talking about it, you kept telling everybody that. And that's how these stories work. So it can work. We can have a better future. You know, there's a lot that can be done. And the other part of this, finally, I'll just say, it's also important for us because if we spend all of our time living with the harsh reality of what we're facing, we get burnt out, we suffer PTSD, we give up. And we can't have us doing that, right? Because right now you guys are the core, you're the tip of the spear, you know? So we want to make sure that those stories are there for everyone. So last question before I turn it back over to Clay, anything else, anybody? Awesome, Joe, thank you so much. It's always great to have your imagination uh, tickled to kind of see things in a new way, you know? It's so interesting to me when I started kind of looking at uh, all of this amazing artwork from the 1950s and 1960s, especially in the space race before we actually made it to the moon and the whole country was so activated around technology. In a lot of these drawings, of what people thought the future was going to be like, you have you know moving sidewalks and flying cars and everything is kind of mechanized and moving on its own. There was a big thought that in the future, what we would have was unlimited energy, whether from nuclear or from some other kind of cold fusion or something like that. And unfortunately, what we wound up getting was largely uh, unlimited data and knowledge in the fact that all of us are walking around with supercomputers in our pockets that are very small and can access limitless data, so much, in fact, that we're overwhelmed every moment by the amount of data that's out there. And an increasing amount of people are having difficulty discerning what's true. So as we move into the future, it would be nice to kind of course correct that and move towards having much more free and available clean energy and a really good handle on what is real and what is not in the data that we share with one another. But one can dream. Uh, I'll also say that the power of storytelling is so amazing because I can be in rooms or in panels talking about sustainability-based work, and sometimes there are people that are on the panel with me, and they've got PhDs, they've maybe studied climate science for longer than I've been alive. But the times where I open my mouth and I use no facts that are like numbers, right, or data, rather, and I tell a story, about something that I've experienced and something that's happened, you can hear a pin drop in the room. It's really fascinating how we're all social primates, we're all evolved to really tone in and key in on stories and to remember them and to listen, them, and listen to them. So it, it's an amazing thing to see. In fact, there's so much neurological data that shows that if you tell someone a bunch of facts about something, right, that they actually have their neurons fire less after you're done unloading all of those facts on them. They form like a callus against your facts, but you tell them a story and their brain lights up. So this is a really fascinating thing to keep in mind. So for our breakout today, you've got some whiteboards in front of you. Uh, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take about 10 minutes and focus in on this. Please use the whiteboards in front, and then we'll call uh, you know, a representative from each table to come on up to the microphone. That's called the Solution Showcase, right? where you essentially showcase what it is you've come up with. We're going to take pictures of all of your boards, and we're going to use all of this to inform our next action projects that we're doing. And right after this breakout, I'll share with you some highlights that we have coming up this month of stuff if you want to get involved. And that's another reason why The Hive is always on the first Wednesday of every month. So your breakout, what is an environmental story that you want to tell that's controversial? Okay, so designed to kick the hornet's nest, right? What is that? And devise a plan to tell the story. Is it a blog post? Is it a TikTok? Is it a meme? 
Is it a comic book? Is it a flip book on a napkin or sticky notepad, right? What is a medium, right, that you could do to tell this environmental story? What does that look like to you? And what's it about? And what's the angle that you're going to take now that you've learned a little bit about environmental storytelling today and how to reframe it into the background? So we'll take about 10 minutes and do this, and then we'll come back and bring the hive to a close. So thank you all so much. Grab the whiteboards and markers, have some cookies, grab some avocados in the back, and we'll come back in just about 10 minutes.
Awesome, everybody. I love seeing all of the stuff on the whiteboards, some, some drawings, lots of different colors. So fantastic. All right, so your challenge was, what is an environmental story that we want to tell that is controversial, right? Aren't all the best stories controversial anyway? So you also want to devise a plan to tell this story, right? What's the medium you're going to use to communicate it? Could be a tweet. Could be a series of tweets. Could be a TikTok. Could be a flipbook. Could be a billboard. Whatever you have come up with that you enjoy telling or are still in ways to tell a story that even you may struggle to tell. So, uh, by all means, let's uh, invite someone from your table. Could be the whole table if you want to come up to the mic right there, or it could be one or two representatives from the table, it is your choice, but uh, the microphone is there in the middle of the room, and anyone, go for it. We'll eventually get around to everybody. Uh, and round of applause, just introduce yourself, and uh, w uh, certainly when they're done, let's give them a round of applause. Turn this way. Go to the mic. Okay. Um, my name's Kristen. Um, so what we came up with was the idea of using a track um, to convey a message. So the controversial topic was no more cars in downtown Orlando. Um, and looking at forming, essentially we thought of the idea of a, an umbrella or a parasol that you had to walk around with could be a huge barrier to wanting to walk here um, and, and spending time outside. So the forum was thinking about the impacts of a car for your Orlando and what that looks like if you're all walking to reduce CO2 emissions and things like that. The inspiring was um, kind of the sharing of the idea, but also the sharing of the umbrella. That everyone has their own. You could have someone walk under it with you. You could talk to them while you're under it. You could also pass it on to someone when you're done. Um, and then the empowering is just the buy-in to being a part of something bigger and like acknowledging that you're excited about this park in Orlando rather than feeling burdened by the fact that you can't get into your AC car and drive to where you want to go. Um, so the idea steps from the idea of craftivism, which is using crafts to like convey the message in a softer way rather than kind of putting it in your face. It's something that I recently learned about that a lot of people are doing. I think it's interesting um, because everyone has a different way of conveying a message and if you like to create things with your hands you can still get involved even if it's not necessarily grandstanding on a platform or something like that so that was our idea awesome great work 
I've learned a new word to craftivism. That is awesome. Uh, what a cool idea, you know, and um, it's just amazing. You know, human beings will go to so many different lengths to communicate, right? Many of us have different communication styles, especially there's so much that can transcend different cultures and also, um, you know, different languages and things like that. So bravo, I think that's awesome. And as soon as you mentioned the umbrella, I immediately visualized people walking around in downtown Orlando with this messaging on these umbrellas. So very cool. All right, next table. Please send somebody up. Hi, I'm Nicole. Um, our topic is kind of the removal of single-use plastics. And um, we came up with a series of time-lapse videos for TikTok uh, with some cool inspirational music. Um, uh, the series of videos would start with like the human world of your city life with and without plastic, what it will look like as time is transitioning over, say, 20 years or so. And then also with the natural life, with the world, with the animals, how they're affected by our single-use plastic waste in the world with and without, how they would benefit from it and how they uh, would not benefit from it if we didn't remove it. Like most of the microplastics now that we find in our waterways, especially on cleanups, it's one of the big things that we find. Um, Oh, for our wildlife though, but also utilizing to inspire, showing that we do have organisms and fungi that can break down microplastics that we could use and utilize to help inspire and to break down the waste and show that it is possible that we can use life to do that. Uh, so that'd be really cool seeing the time lapse of those videos of those beings creating and breaking down and hopefully inspiring those to be like, yes, there is a way we have that, that, that pathway and we could utilize it more. Um, and hopefully the sweet beings of this earth helping us create and clean up our mess would be to empower them because the scam of it all, as my niece said, is plastic is hurting the planet is the controversy. So, anything else? Awesome. Awesome, awesome. I love the idea of time-lapse related stuff, right? Uh, even if it's just, uh, you know, showing someone just a few moments into the future or decades right into the future. So it's really important that people kind of get their imagination sparked to see what these worlds that we're trying to create look like until they get that in their minds. Sometimes it's hard to even understand that it exists or is a potential, right? That's one of the cool things about sci-fi, right? It helps us to imagine, you know, other places, other worlds, other times. And man, look at how much technology we have that uh, you know is heavily inspired by science fiction, from the flip phone to uh, you know iPads and all of these other amazing things. So, pretty extraordinary. All right, next table, come on up. Okay, so we talked about a lot about um, several different topics. We talked about uh, what um, this team was talking about, like ban cars uh, as a controversial topic. Uh, personally, I don't think we should ban all cars, but we should reduce the use of cars. Um, and we talked about regenerative agriculture, agriculture, uh, and we talked about anti-capitalism. So all those things that are very controversial. Um, we didn't really get much uh, ideas about like how to tell the story, but I, I have some ideas on the banned cars part. <laughs> Um, I like to think about it as if we had public transit that was frequent and reliable, you wouldn't want to get behind the wheel because it's so annoying. And uh, instead, you could just get on the bus and go where you, where you want to go. And that kind of... Um, that story, which isn't possible right now in Orlando because you have like an hour wait time for a bus to go anywhere. Um, well, most, most bus routes. Um, it's, it's kind of like a futuristic story where you don't have to worry about getting into a crash or being in congestion. You could just go where you want when you want. And that's uh, a really powerful idea, I think. And yeah, I, I think we could probably do s stuff like um, tell the story through uh, just uh, chronicling someone's day in a life 
um, where something else happens is really interesting, but they're also using public transit to do their regular everyday activities. And also, um, I have a plug. Uh, I have some stickers that say, um, save the planet, take transit. So if you want one, come and see me. <laughs> Fantastic. Great work. That's a cool sticker too. Alrighty, and last but not least, the final table. Come on up. Sorry, you weren't sure if we wanted to call it a kids book or just kind of a book in general. Mm -hmm. But when I first came in, Kelly mentioned um, an issue she like struggles with is she in and fast fashion. It's very much regarded as like part of our culture. I think especially for the modern age, um, for younger kids, this is all they know, especially. So with that in mind, we created the story of, sh we called it something else for legal reasons. <laughs> Shen is not cute. Um, and so the story is about a raccoon um, in the future. And he lives, um, well, his name is Toad. So, um, and he's looking, his goal is he's looking for family or a friend. Um, and he doesn't really have any other raccoons around him because they're, you know, kind of extinct um, at, at this time. That's kind of what's implied. Um, and so he's got a full wardrobe, but an empty heart, and he doesn't know better. <laughs> um, so um, his only friend is this moth called Pants. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so we, he, it's also kind of a musical, so he's like wearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's like singing and he's happy and he's just riding around looking for um looking for friends and then finally we're we're still fleshing out the end where um we're not sure if he'll find a friend we haven't gotten that far <laughs> 10 minutes you know um but i think part of the big concept too is because he doesn't know any better he's happy and so even though this is like a weird concept to people i think it'll really make you know, teens and kids and whatever think about how, like, how can he be happy? He's alone. Um, and then maybe open their eyes up to thinking like, okay, some people don't know any better. Maybe if you show them a better way and show them that there is better out there, their minds will be open to that. Yeah. Great job. You know, there's all kinds of different tropes people can use too in storytelling. Right? There's an arc that, uh, that the characters go through. One of the most famous ones is the hero's journey, right? And that's something that George Lucas used to uh, deadly effect in his creation of Star Wars, right? Which was a retelling of this archetypal hero's journey, but in space, right? And, uh, you know, certainly hit a, a nerve of, of cultural, global everything for decades and decades. So storytelling and the kinds of theming around it really matters well thank you everyone that's fantastic please don't erase your boards we're going to take some pictures of them and uh, we'll pop them up on our hive or our uh, ideas for us orlando web uh, page on facebook so please check that out and now i really want to share about some great events that we have coming up and then we'll turn over the microphone to anyone in the audience who wants to share uh different things that uh that they may have going on so we've got a community cleanup coming up in Pine Hills, which is not too far from here. And that's coming up on the 13th, 9.30 in the morning till 12 p.m. One of the cool things about that is Wells Fargo Fost, uh, is funding a lot of community and betterment work in areas around their banks. So trash cleanups, tree plantings, uh, invasive exotic species removals, uh, all different types of things. So please join us. Again, you can find out all of the details about these different action projects happening on our Facebook page for Ideas for Us Orlando. We're also building a school garden. We're expanding the Walden Community School Garden. That's going to be happening Friday, August 5th. So that's this Friday, 9.30 to noon. So that's going to be happening at this community school. We've got a call for volunteers that want to join in the community. Uh, if you would be in school that Friday, just skip a school and come to this one and help plant the garden. And uh, that is, I'll, uh, we will write you an absentee note, so do not worry. 
We're also having an upcycling workshop where we can come together and, you know, we'll have all different kinds of materials. We've been doing these really cool upcycling style events, sometimes a clothing swap, sometimes swaps of all different kinds of uh, things in the community. And this one's all around taking goods and upcycling them. So August 24th, 6 p.m. at our headquarters, which is at 1030 West Cayley Street, and we're going to have candle making, flower pressing, bookmark making, t-shirts, tote bags, painted planters, and if you want to bring things, if you have lots of materials or something like that, a box full of old t-shirts, whatever it may be, bring those in. We can definitely find use for them. We also love cardboard because we use them in our farms, so if you happen to have like pallets worth of cardboard, bring that too. Okay, great. So those are our events that we have so far that are coming up that are open to the public. Very often we have events that uh, different communities and, and uh, partners that we have will have not be open to the public. But especially as it starts to cool down uh, a little bit, we're going to be doing uh, a whole lot more each month. So this is the point where anyone in the audience, if you have something to share, if you're part of an organization yourself, if you want to uh, let everyone know about something going on in the community that's important to us, we call that bike rack, where basically your class lets out, everyone rushes to grab their bike, and it's a great time to catch up and talk with people of, hey, what's going on? What are you doing? What's happening this Friday? All of these things. This is a term that we brought from when we were just a student club uh, back in 2008 at a college. So Bike Rack is where we share information about groups, clubs, help promote great partners in the community. So if anyone would like to take the microphone, please jump up there, share something going on. And if not, we'll bring the hive to a close. Sure, come on up. All right. All right. Um, so, hey, uh, I'm Lewis. This is uh, Allison. Um, and uh, we're from ESA, part of uh, Bank of New York Mellon. And uh, we're just reaching out to our uh, uh, organizations to volunteer um, and be a part of you guys. Um, we're, we're getting, like, uh, we just get a group of volunteers from the bank, and it's a win-win uh, for every volunteer. We pay you, and then, um, and it's just a uh, organization. Do you want to say anything else? That's, yeah, that's within our organization, but we also are looking to create some events. So if your organization, such as like Wells Fargo or anything, is interested in doing kind of a crossover event, I know banks like to work together. So we're BNY Mellon. Um, that's where we work. So if your organization is interested in partnering with our organization to do like a beach cleanup or something cool, please reach out. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we're definitely interested, so we'll team up for sure. But uh, certainly, you know, the Hive has gone on, as I mentioned, every single first Wednesday of the month for almost 10 years now. So we have had so many, probably tens of thousands of different people in the community pass through the Hive. It's always different. There's always, you know, wonderful leaders, whether you're looking for a job or an internship, connections somewhere, please ask, right? We have really, really vast networks in this community. We're always happy to help. We're always happy to point you in the right direction. That's one of our services here to the community as a nonprofit. And that brings us to the end of this hive. So thank you so much. We want to thank our wonderful host, the Center for Health and Wellbeing here. As they mentioned, this is open to the public. They do have member-only gyms and pools and all kinds of things like that. But uh, coming in here and utilizing space they make open for other organizations in the community to utilize, they're so nice they give us this room for free. So we really do appreciate that. And let's just give them a round of applause if you don't mind. Fantastic. All right. Thank you all so much. And uh, I believe these are just some social media things for you to find uh, this place online. So do engage that way. Thank you all so much. We're very happy to have you here tonight, and we'll see you all next month, hopefully. Thanks.